Welcome. I'm Peter Saltonstall, the President and CEO of Nord, and would like to welcome you today to our Project RDAC stakeholder meeting. Glad that you could join us today. I have to say that since 1983, Nord has recognized that the rare disease community really does need a strong voice in government. And we've done that both at the federal and the state level. And today I really want to focus on RDACs, which is our state level tool for being able to accomplish that. Whether it's informing work at the state level or passing legislation, um, it is, the RDACs are critically important for us. And utilizing the RDAC as a tool um, to, to help us accomplish those goals is something that's critically important to us. I will say to you that over the last year, we've been very successful in accomplishing uh, the, the rolling out of 21 RDACs and think that um, this year, uh, we'd like to see that number grow as much as we can. And so we're really relying on you all and, and programs like this today to be able to um, help us and you all have the tools to, to move forward to help us go from our 21 to uh, at least doubling that number. And so today we put together a number of panels for you to, to basically be able to speak to people that have experience in the space, that know how to do it. We wanna to talk to you about our toolkits and so on, and hope that you'll find it informative, helpful, and a way for us to move forward as we, uh, as we uh, continue to try to grow our decks throughout this, this coming year. Also wanna take a moment to say that we have a, a great uh, video that we're gonna show you in just a moment, but would also like to thank the sponsors that have really made it um, all possible today for us to be able to, to put this kind of program on. So I really wanna thank those sponsors before we go forward. They include Alexion, Biogen, Bluebird Bio, Boringo Ingelheim, CSL Bearing, Horizon, Genentech, Pfizer, Sarepta, Vertex and Takeda. Listen, I hope you really enjoy today's program and find it uh, both informative and helpful. So on to the video. What is a Rare Disease Advisory Council or RDAC? There are over 25 million Americans living with one of the more than 7,000 unique rare diseases. Even though an estimated one in 10 Americans have a rare disease, State policymakers often have limited awareness of the impact that rare diseases have on patients, their caregivers, and the overall healthcare system. Bridging that awareness gap means there is a need to create a standing advisory council in each state made up of members from the rare disease community to help educate legislators and state policymakers about how best to serve rare disease patients in their state. Rare Disease Advisory Councils, or RDACs, are the solution. An RDAC is an advisory body that gives the rare disease community a stronger voice in state government. RDACs address the needs of the rare disease community by providing stakeholders an opportunity to make formal recommendations to state leaders about the most critical issues they face. To date, there are more than 20 RDACs. Nord started Project RDAC with the ambitious goal of establishing a successful RDAC in every state and to help optimize the RDACs that already exist. To help foster successful RDACs at every step along the way, Nord has developed a series of resources. Want to get involved? Contact us. Thank you, Peter, for those welcome remarks, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elise Patel, and I serve as the Western Region State Policy Manager at the National Organization for Rare Disorders. I hope you found the Rare Disease Advisory Council video to be informative, especially for those of you who are new to RDEX. We have a great webinar in store for you today that will provide an overview of our Project RDAC Year 1 successes, a look ahead to 2022, and two wonderful panels that will allow you to hear from RDAC leaders across the country. North launched Project RDAC last year to help optimize the existing RDACs and to increase the number of RDACs across the country. Under this initiative, North is helping to lead diverse coalitions aimed at establishing new RDACs and is working to provide opportunities 
for the RDAX to collaborate with one another to share best practices. NORD has also created a plethora of resources to assist the rare disease community and RDAX throughout each step of the process. And before we dive into our RDAC engagement this past year, I would like to highlight our NORD policy staff. We want to be a resource to you and to all of your RDACs. If you have any questions, concerns, want to promote meetings or opportunities for engagement, please reach out. We've set up a special email address, rdac at rarediseases.org, but you can also reach out to any of our policy team members individually. And as you can see, this past year was a busy year when looking at the creation of new RDACs across the country. Since the launch of Project RDAC last fall, we were thrilled to help seven states pass RDAC legislation that was signed into law, bringing the total number of states that have passed RDAC legislation to 21. These states include Florida, Louisiana, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Ohio, South Carolina, and Virginia. The success that we had in Massachusetts, Ohio, South Carolina, and New Jersey were the culmination of multi-year efforts, and states like Virginia and Louisiana surprised us by just how quickly the bills were introduced and moved through the legislative process. We're excited to share that Florida, Louisiana, Massachusetts, South Carolina, and Virginia have completed their initial member appointments for the councils, and have hosted their first RDAC meeting. Maine and Michigan currently have pending legislation and Wisconsin was just added to the list late last week uh, with the introduction of their RDAC bill. During this past year, we also worked with eight different states on their RDAC engagement efforts. In Arkansas and California, we worked on advancing active legislation. And in Georgia, Maryland, Texas, and Washington, we helped form rare disease coalitions to examine legislative opportunities. And then in Indiana and Mississippi, we spoke to advocates interested in learning how to start the coalition building process. So while the process to create an RDAC is unique in every state, one thing is for certain, and that is that it takes engagement from the entire rare disease community to make an RDAC possible. To assist in this process, NORD has created several resources for advocates in the past, and in the past year, we've hosted two stakeholder meetings, we've had four workshops for members of existing RDACs. We've also created a NORDPOD podcast episode and developed three toolkits designed to help navigate the coalition building process, the legislative process, and then implementation of an RDAC after it's signed into law. With each toolkit released, we also hosted a corresponding webinar. And the chart on the right-hand side of the slide shows the state engagement in action and is a good reminder of the hard work and dedication needed to create an RDAC in any state. Let's take California, for example. Over the course of this past year, we formed a diverse coalition from the rare disease community and hosted five large group meetings over a dozen smaller coalition leadership meetings, submitted six letters of support from 31 patient organizations within the state, and also had over 50 legislators contacted by their constituents on the importance of this legislation through action alerts. All of these efforts helped get the bill passed in the California legislature. Unfortunately, Governor Newsom vetoed the bill in early September and asked us to try again next year through the budget process. Despite this setback, we are fortunate to have strong advocates and a strong group of rare disease advocates throughout the state ready to modify our legislative strategy based on both feedback and lessons learned from this year, and hopefully will be successful next year. Anissa, would you like to share an example of engagement from the Eastern region? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Elise. Uh, so in Florida, we were able to quickly secure a Senate sponsor. However, Florida requires that all legislation have a sponsor from each chamber. So after searching for a House sponsor for over a month, Nord finally connected with an amazing legislature who wanted to honor his mother by championing RDAC legislation. 
However, there was a delay in the House sponsor getting the bill transferred over to them before the Florida legislature's deadline, which almost prevented the bill from moving forward. So after connecting with numerous stakeholders, Nord was able to identify the member who submitted the bill and successfully had it transferred to the House sponsor. So after nine hearings and submitting 27 documents of written testimony, the legislation was signed into law. Uh, keen observers inside and outside of the Florida legislature were surprised to see our House and Senate sponsor working together since they are well known for having extremely different political stances. Uh, despite their differences, both sponsors shared the personal connections that they had to the rare disease community and emphasized that an RDAC is a nonpartisan issue that could be an enormous asset to Florida's rare disease community. Florida's RDAC is now meeting regularly um, and engaging with rare disease advocates throughout the state. Um, so in the next slide, so uh, as we mentioned, we are planning to continue to work alongside existing RDACs to help them identify uh, policy issues that can support their state's uh, rare disease community. So one resource to help identify policy areas that need improvement is the NORD state report card. So we're also collaborating with stakeholders and rare disease advocates to build and maintain strong state-based coalitions to get additional RDAC legislation across the finish line in 2022. Currently, we have an active RDAC coalition, or we have received requests to focus on pursuing an RDAC in the states listed on the chart. So in the Western region, they include Arizona, California, Colorado, and Wisconsin. And in the Eastern region, they're Connecticut, Georgia, Maryland, and Michigan. It's important to note that this is a quick snapshot of states that advocates have expressed interest in for 2022 so far. It is possible that additional states of interest will be pursued within the next few months and for RDAC legislation to be introduced in other states that are not listed here. So where can you learn about your state's RDAC status? The first step is to visit our website at rarediseases.org slash project RDAC. This website includes a map that will let you know which states are actively working on pursuing RDAC legislation, states with existing RDACs, and states that have not yet pursued an RDAC. Our website also includes an events tab that lists upcoming RDAC coalition meetings that you can register for. Under the resource tab, you can find helpful resources that can provide guidance on how to get an RDAC started in your state, how you can influence the introduction, enactment, or modification of RDAC legislation, and how to strengthen an existing RDAC to elevate the voice of the rare disease community. So please feel free to reach out to our team with any state-specific questions or to learn more about what it takes to build an RDAC coalition. Right, so, um, so up next, we will be hearing from our first group of panelists on their state's RDAC coalition efforts uh, this past year and where they are headed in uh, 2022. So our panelists featured in this discussion include Mike Hugh, Jana Monaco, and Carrie Nelson, all of whom serve as volunteer state ambassadors in their prospective states. Great, so I am uh, excited to transition to our panel to hear about some of the great work that newly established RDACs are doing and to hear about the coalition building process. So I'm going to ask that our panelists introduce themselves before we dive into our questions. So Jana, um, I will go ahead and start with you. Great, thank you, Anissa. I'm Jana Monaco and a parent of two children with a rare disease, which has enabled me to advocate and become the state ambassador for RAN for the state of Virginia and the newly appointed vice chair of our Rare Disease Advisory Council here in Virginia. Thank you so much. And I'll pass it over to Carrie. Hi, my name is Carrie Nelson, and I'm the South Carolina Volunteer State Ambassador. I am actually both the mother to a son with a rare disorder and an advanced practice nurse. So as you can see, my personal and professional life are both encompassed by the rare community. I hope you find today's panel to be beneficial just as much as the one that I participated in when I was trying to start my RDAC. Perfect. Great, Mike, if you want to introduce yourself. 
Hi everyone, my name is Mike Hu. I live in Northern California. Uh, I've been working with Nord since 2018. Uh, about 10 years ago, two of my boys were diagnosed with a rare disease called mucopolysaccharidosis type two. Um, and we've been living with the disease for a, a decade. My uh, professional background is a scientist. So right now I'm focusing on uh, promoting newborn screening forward. Great, thank you all so much. Um, so I am going to go ahead and dive into the first question for all of our panelists. So you're each serving as volunteer ambassadors with NORD. So what got you interested in volunteering with NORD's Rare Action Network in the first place? And I will uh, start with Mike to answer that question. Yeah, so with our uh, decade of living with a rare disease, um, initially, we got a lot of help from Nord in terms of, you know, finding out what the disease is about, what are the, uh, you know, current state of the art treatments out there, and what are the supports we can get. And as we live the experience, um, what we have realized is how little uh, we actually have in terms of support and how much advocacy is needed uh, in order to bring in more support. So. Uh, we've been on the advocacy journey for uh, a good part of the past decade. And uh, when I learned about the opportunity at Nord uh, for the RAN ambassador, uh, I thought, you know, where else better to start uh, serving, uh, uh, you know, uh, with the community with a, a, a more involvement. So that's where I started. Great. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, Jana? I like Mike started because of my children. Um, 20 years ago, my son Stephen was diagnosed with an inborn air metabolism called isovaleric acidemia. It was a late diagnosis at age three and a half and caused a traumatic brain injury and all the other complications that arise with a late diagnosis. And I quickly learned that had his condition been on the newborn screening panel for our state, things could be very different and he would have been diagnosed at birth. And so our daughter came along and a year later and with the two having the same condition but very different outcomes because she was screened early, I began to advocate for newborn screening to, to expand our newborn screening panel in the state and around the country. And that blossomed into advocating more for rare diseases as a whole. And since I was already advocating kind of on my own but with the help of others, I had a lot of support from Nord, and when the Rear Action Network program started, I was asked if I would take on an official title of ambassador, and, and I, I thought it was the perfect match, and, and that's how I, I went there, went through with that, because I just believe so much in what Nord promotes in its mission. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, uh, I became interested in volunteering with the North Rare Action Network actually when I was going back to school for my DMP. Uh, part of our requirement is to research a topic and implement a change. And at that time, my son, he was a baby, so he was obviously all that I could think about. So I chose my experience with the lack of education that I had received when my son was diagnosed uh, with a rare disorder as my mission to improve the education and start advocating for other rare disorder patients and families. Uh, that ended up turning into developing a rare disorder toolkit that I'd implemented at a couple of healthcare institutions. And further then it got me in touch with RAN and I started volunteering uh, and advocating. Great, well, thank you all. We're so appreciative of your hard work and all the advocacy that you do for the rare disease community. Um, so the next question is also for all of our panelists. So what made you uh, decide that you wanted to establish a rare disease advisory council within your state? And I will uh, start with Jana to answer this. Given that I was already working in my volunteer position for RAN, um, you know, I look to, to Nord each year to see what is on its uh, agenda for programs and policies. And as I learned about the, the goal of having RDACs across the country, I jumped on the opportunity. I have, you know, worked with our delegate here who was all for it. And I said, let's, let's do this. And, 
and um, we began the process and went forward. And I also believe that having this body uh, that, of people that focuses on rare diseases was so important instead of kind of working piecemeal with everything that we, we've had to do over the years. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Mike, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, so it came as uh, uh, started with a surprise call from one of my uh, longtime advocacy friends. Um, uh, and it was surprising because uh, California has quite a number of uh, av advisory councils, if you will, uh, you know, ranging uh, widely. And so for the longest time, I had been assuming that we have an RDAC already. So when a friend Siri uh, base called me and said, hey, Mike, do you want to... Uh, you know, consider uh, starting a coalition to work on RDAC. Uh, I was startled because I thought, well, shouldn't we have one already? And so that is uh, definitely a motivation for me to uh, uh, get started on the work. It coincided with the timing that uh, uh, Nord launched the RDAC project. It was literally just a week apart before I got a, a call from Nord. <laughs> so I think the timing is right. Uh, and I think, you know, it serves a tremendous purpose to the rare disease community. So it's a no brainer for me. Absolutely, thank you. I'll pass it over to Carrie. And actually my story is similar to Mike's. Uh, however, initially I had learned about RDAX when I was at the Nord Summit in Washington, DC. A couple of years back, I had participated in a breakout session on the RDAX and learned how North Carolina had implemented one. And instantly I got really excited about it because I knew that this was something I wanted to, to do either in our state or beyond. However, I have to say I was pretty naive at the time and I thought that we should have already had one, um, but I was clearly wrong at that point. Um, also at this point, I wanted our rare disorder community here in South Carolina to have a voice because I am a really strong believer that those who are the experts, which are our patients, our families, the caregivers, the healthcare practitioners, you know, we're the experts in that area. So we should be the ones that are helping to guide our decisions as well as our laws. So through the establishment of an RDAC, we're really giving the patients, the caregivers and the healthcare experts a voice in our local government. So uh, like I said, I was really excited at that moment to start implementing it here. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so our next question is for Mike and Carrie. So a really important part of the advocacy process is for advocates to work with their coalition and organizations like Nora to advocate for an RDAC. So can you explain a bit about what an RDAC coalition is and how you help to form one in your state? And I will go ahead and start with you, Carrie. Yeah, so essentially a coalition, it's an alliance of people that have a combined action or goal. So for us, our action was to develop a rare disease advisory council here in South Carolina. Um, and the coalition, it had included stakeholders from our rare disease community, which included our RAN members, member organizations, along with the industry as well. Uh, initially, we had opened up meetings to build the coalition. Uh, we did keep the meetings open to all within our community, the RAM members, the organizations and industry. For the first few meetings, we had kept that open uh, because if you've ever been part of building a group of uh, volunteers, many are really excited and interested in the beginning. However, as time goes on, they realize time commitments and their schedules, sometimes their interests slowly will decline. So uh, after that, we did this to really establish our strong group. And one great thing is that I felt that we were also supported throughout this whole process from NORD, uh, not only with just our sample language, but guidance, because I was also new to this. I had never participated in something like this. It was out of my comfort zone. Um, they were very transparent with us on how other states had established the RDACs and their coalitions and built their strong groups, along with getting us in touch with each other on what worked, what didn't work, because that really is important to know. Um, and as we do know, each state is very different. So what may have worked in one state doesn't mean that it necessarily will work with yours and vice versa. We ended up, we hosted our meetings virtually. And I would say that finding a time that works for everyone was the biggest struggle that I had. 
Um, obviously, I had to plan around my own schedule for work and my kids, but then respecting other people's schedules. So I would say that would be one of the challenges that we had faced in building our coalition and keeping everybody together. Great. Thank you, Carrie. And then, Mike, I'll pass it over to you. And Carrie has uh, hit on so many great points. I almost want to repeat her. Um, but, um, you know, as to what a coalition is, you know, it's uh, definitely great um, to have her preceding that. Uh, I want to uh, follow up on what I started earlier on the coalition building process, which you already know, uh, started from a call from my friend Siri. And uh, what we have experienced is quite similar. You know, the initial uh, enthusiasm and excitement in joining a, a bigger group call uh, would wane. And I think it's very understandable because, you know, we're in a very occupied and busy community, if you will. Uh, everyone has their hands full. So in order to uh, make the time to participate in these meetings, uh, you know, every time and sustained, it, it, it is really challenging. So what we end up um, doing is we have built a uh, core team, if you will, a, a, a few core members who are more available and more, um, uh, you know, have, have time and energy to drive it forward, uh, work with the um, uh, legislator to uh, move the agenda forward uh, while keeping everyone else in the loop so that the burden on them is uh, more manageable. Uh, so far, it has been working fine, I would say. You know, what, what we needed for the coalition to do, for example, to bombard the legislators in every district, uh, that we cast out to the entire coalition, so everyone is helping out. Uh, but when there are small topics that are coming up, there are urgent topics that needs to be addressed very soon. Uh, we have this core group that can still make informed decisions on behalf of the bigger coalition and move the agenda forward. So it's um, important to strike a balance between being too demanding and being too laid back. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. Um, yes, yeah, so there have been several diverse coalitions in various states pushing for the creation of these councils across the country. And one of the first legislative advocacy steps that we encourage advocates to work on um, is building a coalition to fill in some model RDAC language that NOR developed um, and refined with input from various stakeholders. So the model language can really help the coalition think about what issues to prioritize for action by the council and helps give the council a bit of a, a roadmap um, when it comes to be, it being established and signed into law. So next question is for all of our panelists. Um, so it's really important to note, of course, that every state's legislative process when advocating for RDAC legislation can look really different. So some experience a smooth process with few obstacles, while others might encounter some unanticipated barriers and need to work alongside other advocates um, to strategize on how to over overcome them. So can you each tell us um, a little bit about what the legislative process looked like with your state's RDAC effort? Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and start with Janet to answer this question. Yeah, I, I was really surprised at the ease of our process. I've been actually advocating and, and working on different forms of legislation since 2005 with our expanded newborn screening. And I've seen how over the years, when you go to your general assembly, like ours in Virginia, you know, the, the legislators are inundated with so much information. You get minutes to, to touch base with them, to try to pass your point along and get their support. And so fortunately, I over the years, I've been able to connect, especially in the last five years, with a particular delegate who, who can relate personally to a rare disease. And so I had her attention and I had her, had her commitment. And we had already got legislation passed the past couple of years for other things related to rare diseases. So when it was time to pursue our RDAC, we took the language, you know, mm -hmm. thanks to the um, policy people with NORD and worked with her staff and, and she submitted it as one of her, her bills. And with each step in um, going through each subcommittee throughout our General Assembly, it, it worked. We, it was a unanimous decision with each committee that it had to go through. 
And so it took probably, I think, five months and, and it was done and, you know, it was voted in. There were a few little amendments to some of the language towards the end and it went from the House, it was passed over to the Senate side. They okayed everything and we were done. And it, yeah. I mean, it was great. I kept pinching myself to think that, you know, is it is it really going to happen? And it did. And I think mm -hmm. it's to the credit of just, you know, having established that relationship and right. our, many of our, our our people knew that they, they were mm -hmm. not foreign to rare diseases. It's like that rare disease thing kept popping up. And I think mm -hmm. they just saw, okay, there's an opportunity. This is here to stay and, and, and this yeah. is going to be a great um organization a great group mm -hmm. to work on this absolutely thank you jenna and just to be mindful unfortunately we have three more minutes left i'll pass it over to, to carrie okay i would say as far as that goes my biggest talking point is to have transparency maybe added to your bill language for the application process in particular uh, because that was one piece uh, in our process that hindsight we would have liked to have added so I'll just throw that in there. Great, Mike. Um, uh, a lot has been said, so uh, I, I would just add that uh, even though uh, it's uh, a diverse group uh, who uh, obviously grew up here, uh, instead of uh, you know I, I I'm an immigrant, I came here in my twenties. Uh, so at the beginning, it was like a civic lesson one on one to me to learn about the whole process. Uh, but I think the biggest thing is having a uh, legislator and office help uh, to champion this effort and to work together with the coalition. Uh, our champion Jacob uh, at uh, Senator Eggman's office has been, you know, that person. And so with his understanding of the whole process, it, you know, really helped tremendously to move it forward. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and with the time that we have left, I would love to go ahead and just ask Jana um, how folks can get involved in Virginia's RDOC and um, if you've started meeting yet. We have. We have had our first meeting and it was more, I would say, kind of a, a meet and greet for all of the committee members, the council members to, to be introduced to one another. When we reviewed the language the, uh, of the RDAC and um, and what kind of things we will be looking at, more or less just looking at our schedules. So the chair and I have now met with the Department of Health staff to, to go forward and, and kind of set out a survey to, that will go out to our council and, and start planning our meetings. Great, that's perfect. And then are, your, are the meetings open or how can folks get engaged in the Virginia ZARDAC? We are still learning learning about that. That part was not discussed yet. You know, the focus was more just to bring this body together because we had so little time once all the council members were chosen and we had to have a meeting within two weeks of that time. Absolutely. Well, great. Well, thank you um, all so much to, for joining us today. We really appreciate all of your hard work and dedication to give the rare disease community a stronger voice in state government by advocating for the establishment of an RDAC. So um, now I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Erica Barnes, who will be moderating our second panel, where the panelists will be sharing information about um, existing RDACs. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Anissa, so much. And thank you for that wonderful um, panel um, of people who are working so hard to build coalitions in all the states. It's so exciting uh, to see the work that's being done. Um, so now for the second panel, we're gonna kind of move into engaging with some leadership from um, states that have already been able to pass legislation and establish RDEX in their state. So we'll be talking a little bit um, and the focus will be on sharing some information that would well, that will hopefully give some insight in how to keep moving the legislative process forward for states that are working on establishing RDEX, as well as uh, getting a little bit of insight and having some discussion around the future of RDEX um, for those that are established 
um, and making those effective and, and effectively incorporate the voice of the rare disease community. Um, so I'll introduce the panelists in a minute. Um, I want to introduce myself as well. Uh, again, my name is Erica Barnes, and I administer the Chloe Barnes Advisory Council on Rare Diseases in the state of Minnesota. In 2019, I was um, honored to lead a 42-member coalition. It was cross-sector. Um, I had so much support from some wonderful um, institutions in the state of Minnesota, and we were able to pass that legislation in 2019. So our council is now housed at the University of Minnesota out of the medical school. Um, and now I'm going to introduce the wonderful panelists that we have. I'm first going to introduce, um, and I'll have actually them introduce themselves. Um, so um, our panelists are Assemblyman Dan Benson, Thera Meehan, and Dr. Scott Strom. And I want them to actually introduce themselves. So how about you go first, um, Assemblyman Benson? Great. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to be here. I have served in the legislature just over 10 years. Uh, and I serve on the budget committee. I serve on the health committee. Both of those are important to the issues that we're talking about here. And I serve as chair of transportation. I've uh, been an advocate on rare diseases and um, working with families in that community for probably the whole time I've been elected official. I've served at the local and county levels as well prior to become a state assembly person. And it's just been great working not only with the community and families, but with my colleagues and watching them become more educated on these issues and really becoming uh, champions as well. Fantastic. Thera, do you want to go next? Hi, uh, my name is Thera Meehan, and I am a policy consultant to the Bureau of Infectious Disease and Laboratory Sciences at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Uh, which is where the newly formed Rare Disease Advisory Council sits in Massachusetts. And I'm working closely with our chair, Dr. Dylan Tierney. Fantastic. And Dr. Strom. Sure. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Scott Strom. I'm the executive dean and the vice chancellor for clinical affairs at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center and the College of Medicine. Um, I chair the Rare Disease Advisory Committee for the state of Tennessee. I'm a head and neck cancer surgeon and an immunologist by training. Fantastic. Well, I can't I can't wait to jump into this discussion and hear all of your insights partly so that I can I can take notes for the state of Minnesota as well. <laughs> so I want to start with Assemblyman Benson. So I kind of want to just start at the beginning. And one of the things I loved hearing um, Anissa talking about sort of the bipartisan work that was going on in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, it was kind of a thread that I was hearing even on the next panel when um, Jana Monaco was talking. So I wanna ask you, what inspired you as a legislator to sponsor mm -hmm. this legislation? What, what, do you, what resonates with you and what do you think is resonating with legislators? Well, for me, I, I have a science background. My undergraduate was in physics and my graduate work is in science policy. Um, but I actually got started in politics representing my hometown in Hamilton, uh, which is kind of in central Jersey. Um, and so we had a, a set of parents with a child with rare disease, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Um, and they started a nonprofit called Ryan's Quest. Uh, the parents, one was a local police officer, one was a local teacher. And just working with them really educated myself on many of the needs surrounding not only research, but trials and the way the state government makes decisions on insurance and so many other issues around rare diseases. So when I uh, got to the legislature and was on the health committee, this was already something that I was interested in. And I started talking with parents uh, of different rare diseases and different advocacy groups, as well as folks from the pharmaceutical industry and from uh, different uh, other representative groups um, to really talk about what some of the changes were needed. And we had some early successes in my career uh, and I was able to sponsor legislation uh, in various areas, medical access, um, um, better education, better testing, all of those. So when um, folks came to us, uh, Nord and, and other representatives, and particularly families and parents telling their personal story, the idea of having an RDAC in New Jersey just made sense. 
And so we, myself and uh, Ron Dancer, who's a Republican colleague who represents the shore area of New Jersey, uh, we teamed up uh, on the uh, uh, assembly side and we had great Senate sponsors as well. Um, and it took a little bit, but it was, it was, there was never really a doubt. It was just a matter of working the process and really focusing on getting more co-sponsors from our colleagues. Um, and because of some of that other success in earlier issues, the pathway was already made. And, and so, you know, that's one of the things we'll talk about in some of the other questions that you have, but, um, you know, success begets success. And, and that's why I'm really excited about the ARDAC because I think, more of the legislators are now interested in hearing more, and now we're putting together the right people at the right time to answer many of the questions that legislators have, and hopefully that the administration, uh, as they make decisions, will have people at the table. That's great. That That's so encouraging. I, I know that our legislation passed in a, we were one of only two states with a divided legislature the year that I worked on the legislation. And I remember thinking, oh boy, <laughs> here we go. Um, but it passed unanimously um, with bipartisan support. So it's exciting to see sort of this this bipartisanship in, in all the different states. So that's really exciting. So Assemblyman Benson, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question kind of uh, to kind of build on the last question I asked. So once an RDAC bill is introduced, once uh, the community finds a chief author, what would you say would be the best way for advocates to be able to support those authors and really to be able to um, help support the legislation as it goes through the legislative process, as the chief authors are working and the co-sponsors? My first advice for any individual, um, once they learn about the bill, is really to partner with an advocacy organization. And I can't emphasize this so much because legislation either is moving quickly or moving slowly, but there's always something new happening. Um, and so rather than reinventing the wheel, it's really important to touch base with those groups that are really advocating for its passage. You can find out what's really needed next. If it was just introduced, it could be about talking to your legislator about becoming a co-sponsor of the bill because that's an easy way to bank a yes vote when it comes to the floor. Um, if it hasn't been posted in committee, it's asking the sponsor to ask the chair of the committee it's been assigned to, to post the bill. Um, and if that person actually lives in that chair's district, even better. And that's part of the thing of, you know, trying to figure out the geography of a piece of legislation is really important and knowing where it is. And the average person is not gonna know that. So partnering with organizations has helped. Um, second, of uh, looking at who are the other members that are on the committee, uh, because again, if you're a member, or even if you're not, because you have a personal story, you want to connect to those folks that are going to probably vote on that bill first before it reaches the full floor. Um, so, you know, step one, find out what the status of the bill is. Step two, ask your legislator to be a co-sponsor if they're not already. If they are, and this is really important, if they're a, if they're a prime sponsor, you know, the folks that actually introduced the bill, or if they're co-sponsors, Take a moment, just thank your legislator. It'll keep them in support of the bill, no matter what changes. And I'll tell you, oftentimes bills that I'm a sponsor of, I will get folks advocating for me to support my own bill. And oftentimes that, you know, it's, it's a waste of resources and we want to focus on folks. And I thank them and inform them, but we want to make sure folks are focused on uh, leadership, members of the committee where it'll be heard, and then ultimately members of the full house. Always focus on your own personal story have an ask, co-sponsor the bill, vote, support the bill in committee, support the bill on the floor. If you're writing to leadership, that's your Senate president or your speaker, just asking them to make sure that they post the bill either in committee or post it for a full floor vote when that time comes. Um, and again, after make that ask first and then tell your personal story, whether that's in a letter or email or even a postcard, all of those work. And try to ask for a meeting with your legislator to tell that story. It's okay if you get a chief of staff or if you get a staff member. Many times, particularly in certain offices, that's probably even more important than the, than the legislator themselves because they're the ones managing, particularly in frantic times of during the legislative process, on bills, unless it's the legislator's own bill. Um, so really managing all of that, best thing you can do is, is to represent your story and tell why that's so important to you personally um, and some families in your district. And, and I think that that really covers everything. That's great. So it sounds like there's a fair amount of tactical um, steps that need to be taken as well as relational. So that was very helpful for people uh, to have that information. The other big thing I'll say is don't be nervous. We have a lot of first time folks reach out to us. It is normal. 
take your time. It's okay to be nervous. Um, just know, you know, generally you're going to get a solid 15 minutes, if not a half an hour, in some cases even more, um, to tell your story. And it's okay to take a little bit. It's okay to cry sometimes because this is emotional. We sometimes cry with our constituents. Um, but uh, hopefully that's when the bill passes. Um, <laughs> but legislative pro The other thing is patience. Le legislative process has a lot of ups and downs. Um, you know, you heard in California where you, you know, you had a, a, a veto of the bill. Bills oftentimes may take more than one try to get through. Definitely stay positive um, and, you know, things do turn around. So that's my other piece of advice. You have to be ready for the long haul. Yeah, that is that is great. And that one definitely resonates with me, that, that understanding that it's a slow process sometimes. So... Thank you. Um, so now I'm going to move into a little bit more of an implementation question. So I'm going to direct these question, this question at Thera and Scott. Um, so um, the both of your RDACs are relatively new, correct? Massachusetts and Tennessee. Um, so I want to ask a little bit if you have some insight into engagement and awareness. So um, how are you all reaching out to the rare disease community or how do you plan to reach out um, in your state to engage the rare disease community in the work that you're doing um, and kind of keep them aware of council progress? I'll start with Thera. Do you have some insight into um, strategies you're using or ideas you have to really engage the community? Uh, well, at, at our, uh, our DAC in Massachusetts is very young. Uh, we were just signed into law in January of 2021 and we've had one meeting so far. Um, but even with just that one meeting, we're going to be looking to the members of our Rare Disease Advisory Council to uh, guide us on the best ways to engage the rare disease community and how to keep them engaged. Uh, we have folks on the council who are legislators. We have clinicians, medical providers, researchers, folks with lived experience, advocates, much more knowledgeable than the department in terms of telling us what to focus on um, or what areas to focus on. We do have, we've set up a web page um, on our, on the Department of Public Health website, uh, which certain, not everything will be posted and it's really in its infancy, but we also want to use that as well and encourage members to tell us other resources to put on the web page. Great, great. Scott, do you have any additional thoughts on that or something you're doing in Tennessee? Uh, sure. So we've been around, I guess, a bit over a year now. Um, we've done several things. Um, you know, when we started off, uh, the first thing we did was we engaged colleagues at UT to help us build a website um, that's interactive um, so that all our meeting uh, are posted on there and folks know where to go. We also post documents that may be helpful to the rare disease community in Tennessee and legislation, et cetera. Um, the second thing we did was we made it our practice to have a patient with rare disease come and speak to us at each meeting for about 10 or 15 minutes and tell their story. And that was very important to us because we were legislatively under our um, formation mandated to really weigh in on several things. You know, in our state, it's called 10 care, but 10 care approval of certain drugs, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in order to really define our purpose, we wanted to let our quote unquote constituents help us with that. And in order to do that, we needed to listen to a lot of stories. So we made it our practice to do that. And then, and that's been really incredible, uh, very emotional, very, um, just to listen to the stories and to really focus on where folks are having problems. And as we'll talk about a little later, we came down that we really wanted to help in the area of eliminating patients' diagnostic odysseys. Um, so really beginning to put across, I call it a tumor board, but I'm a head and neck surgeon, but essentially a rare disease advisory board across all the major universities at Tennessee. So a patient will have a one-stop shop and can get genomic testing, et cetera, and a full consultation whether they live in a city or in rural Tennessee or 
or wherever so they'll have access to care. And then um, the third thing we did was we created a survey um, which is online so that our constituents can talk to us and let us know that what we what they feel is important um, for us to be focusing on. And so that's up and, um, and running and that's what we did. Great, I, I love all that bilateral communication that you both talked about, ways you're communicating out with the community and the ways you're listening back to the community. So that's great. Um, I We got a really great question to come in from the chat. So I wanna jump back to Assemblyman Benson because I think this is a great question that came in on the chat. Um, so I'm gonna kind of interrupt the flow a little bit, but I think this would be really helpful for people to know. So we had a participant um, bring up the issue of form letters. So the participant said that they'd heard that some legislators say, I don't want to get a form letter, but but the flip side of that is that when it comes to advocacy, this really helps patients kind of get started and, and show their support for a piece of legislation if, if they're new at the process. So the question is, do you believe that form letters are okay when it comes to working with patients and caregivers with rare diseases, or do you have some thoughts on the use of form letters? Form letters are absolutely okay as long as they're from your district. So in other words, a form letter that's coming from outside your district, you're really not gonna pay attention to. We'll pay attention to real stories from people that aren't from our district if it's in our kind of uh, area of expertise, if I'm on health committee, if it's a transportation issue. But if it's a form letter that's not from my district, we're not gonna really take the time. We, we're looking for how many people from our district, really, so it almost becomes a tally at that point. Form letters are also really important if there's a bill where there's opposition. So, you know, Folks that may not have time and everything else, having three people tell us their personal story with a hundred folks from the district supporting something, even if it's a form letter, is really important if there's just one or two people out there that are opposed, particularly if that opposition is not from the district. So I would not discount um, any communication is important. Um, but again, that connection to someone that's your constituent um, is really important. So whether that's a form email, form letter, or a postcard, those are fine. If it's from the district, we pay attention. And that can be, we've done, we've seen, I've worked with advocacy groups that do phone bank, you know, phone calls instead. And so, you know, just calling to say ahead of a vote, hey, I'm your constituent, I live in this neighborhood, please support this bill that's up next week. That seems very, very much, you know, it's very short, much like a form letter. But again, it's if it's from the district and you have an ask that somebody can actually do, and you're we're getting more of that. Uh, if a if a uh, legislator is on the fence, they're going to go with the majority that reaches out to them on that issue. So that's why those form letters can be very important. Just don't call it a form letter. Just you know, you can call it. <laughs> other things. Great, thank you so much. That was super helpful. So now I have a question for everyone, um, and I full disclosure, this is this is my personal question because it's something we've struggled with in the state of Minnesota, <laughs> and I'll be taking notes with everyone's answer. Um, you know, one of the things that we've wrestled with is the fact that we know that the rare disease community is made up of 7,000 very heterogeneous disease patient populations, right? So we know that there's lots of different diseases and it can be challenging to meet the various needs and the varied needs of the different communities. So can each of you speak a little bit to some of the actions you've undertaken or actions that, that you, you have thought, thought about and in, 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 your, in your thinking of the rare community to address those collective needs of the community? Um, and maybe um, I'll start with Thera and Scott and then Assemblyman Benson, if you have a thought from a policy perspective. So, so how are you conceiving of addressing the needs of, of the rare disease community as a whole? Actually, let's start with Dr. Strom, since you haven't gotten to go first yet. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, when we started thinking about this, because rare diseases as a whole really aren't rare. Right, uh, it's it's the rare diseases that are individual that are rare, but when you take them collectively, they're a significant percentage of the population that are affected with rare diseases. And so we divided things up really into large cohorts um, that we thought would be not easy, but that would be broader buckets to affect the community. So disease diagnosis, you know, how does a patient uh, get in and get a diagnosis of disease? Disease management in terms of medication and, and in particular in the rare disease space, um, 
what I've learned that's very important is um, what are called supplements uh, that in fact are not actually supplements, but are life-saving treatments for these individuals that are not covered by insurance in certain cases, and they're not just the regular supplements. And then um, the third thing is interaction with the payers. Um, how is it that um, uh, there, there is uh, a way to interact with payers as individuals to effectively work to advocate your needs? And then the final kind of broader area is research and discovery. And how do we begin to think about research and discovery and advocating for research and discovery in the rare disease space. And then in those four broad buckets, you have a lot of smaller buckets that you can parse them into. But at least for our committee's thinking, that was a very helpful way to start because it seemed like it captured most of the things, maybe not all, but most of the major categories of things that afflicted patients with rare disease. So that's how we've approached it. Fantastic. Um, it, it so happens that we, we have, we're approaching it similarly in the state of Minnesota <laughs> as well. So um, Thera, again, knowing that you're just getting started as, as a council, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I think the, the only thing I want to add is what we're trying to learn from other states who have already taken the step to uh, conduct a needs assessment or send out a survey to, to get a sense of what the environment is in their state. And we're hoping to be able to do that over time. So we see what um, um, uh, issues emerge from that, that will go across several diseases and aren't just specific. Um, in particular, you're talking about the disease odyssey. That was something that came up at our first uh, meeting, but we really need to do some groundwork to know what's uh, going on, but it would be nice to get to the point that uh, Dr. Strom's talking about. Fantastic. Assemblyman Benson, do you have anything with a policy lens that you would sure. add to this? Yeah, I, I'm going to just kind of say two things. I, I think if you know one rare disease, you know one rare disease. And just <laughs> like we train our doctors, uh, in, in different fields, you know, that that's the whole point of Norge using a, a zebra. You know, if you hear hoof beats, it, it may not be a horse. Training legislators is the same thing in policymakers. Um, and again, that's that one thing. If you know one rare disease, you know one rare disease. And understanding that, you know, policies that we make for one needs to be flexible to handle different diseases. And that's why the RDACs are so important. Uh, but that's also true in so many other aspects, whether it's education policy, for uh, children with complex needs, whether it's respite care for adults, whether it's making sure healthcare access um, and access to trials where states actually have roles in this. Um, insurance coverage, I mean, there's just so many insurance issues, but particularly with rare diseases, getting second opinions and getting coverage for those things. Um, things that don't work because it turns out they were treating you for the wrong disease, being able to move immediately to the right drug without, you know, things like step therapy that we're dealing with for other folks, even within the same disease. So there's a whole host of policies that this impacts, but most people are thinking it with just one broad case of diseases. When we're talking about 7,000, we need design, it, it informs us to design policies that are more flexible and to have exceptions. And you know, lastly, the example I give oftentimes is in insurance cases, where you're given particular care until you're stable, and then they take that care away that actually got you to be stable, and then you end up being not stable, and then they give you the care again, and it ends up this weird cycle because the folks that are checking the forms really are checking it for someone that has a completely different condition, and it just does not apply to these cases. So again, that's why having an RDAC is so important, and this is what I hope to see you know, really inform both policymakers that are administering policies, but also for us legislators as we kind of look at new policies going forward. Just uh, one more thing, uh, advice that we've received lately that I think will be helpful is as we think about um, you know, our rare disease composition of our RDACs, 
I think it's probably helpful to have an ethicist on your committee. And it's also helpful to have an economist on your committee. Because if you want to make an uh, argument to a legislature, uh, they're going to listen to science, but ultimately it's going to come down partially to the numbers. And if you have an economist or someone like that helping you make that argument, um, it, it could be more fruitful. That's some great insight. That's right. And I love the emphasis on the flexibility um, and really understanding sort of the, the varied nature to some of these conversations. They're incredibly complex. Um, so now I have a question I want to direct again to Thera and Dr. Strom. Um, could you speak a little bit to both some of the successes that you've had in this first, you know, in your implementation phase, but then also some of the challenges um, that you faced in getting these RDACs off the ground and really getting them, getting them going? Um, Thera, can you speak to some of the successes and challenges that you've had? Sure. I, I would say in Massachusetts, I feel it's a success that uh, we had legislation passed. We had members of the council approved by both uh, branches of the legislature, as well as the governor's office, and had our first meeting in, in uh, less than a year, although we're creeping up on the end of the year. But we are hoping to have our second meeting uh, before 2021 ends as well. So um, it sounds easy, but getting 29 people appointed from various different places and then trying to organize them together is uh, can be complicated. I think the challenge is not being able to meet in person for a brand new group that's trying to work together and um, having to have a you know meeting in a virtual space. But on the other hand, meeting in a virtual space allows allowed almost every appointed member to attend the first meeting, which may not have happened if folks had to drive across the state to attend. So it's a little bit of both on that end. Great. And I, I Thera, I'll add, I think, you know, when I hear you talking about the success of bringing people together, I think, you know, one thing that seems to be as someone, I, I have a history in healthcare and even just bringing a multidisciplinary team of people together in the same room who are not always in the same room. Um, that's been one of the things that's been really exciting for us in the state of Minnesota, you know, having having um, this multidisciplinary group of people, you know, when do you have a payer and in industry and a social worker and a researcher all in the same room talking about one problem I, and a legislator, you know? So I think you are right. I, I don't think you should discount the fact that you brought that group together. That's a huge success. Um, Dr. Strom, do you wanna add, add to that and talk about your own successes and challenges in Tennessee? Sure. I mean, I think that, you know, it's really been rewarding to meet a whole new group of colleagues and friends uh, across the state who are interested in a common goal, which is, you know, helping all people. I, I fundamentally believe that healthcare is a right and, and not a privilege. And, um, you know, so for me, just being able as a, as kind of with my statewide responsibilities at school, it's been uh, really a joy to be able to reach out to more people and hopefully um, help them in their lives, even if it's, it's virtually. I'm very appreciative that our state had the foresight and insight to form this committee. Um, the, the challenges that we face largely come around to the fact that it's an unfunded mandate. And so we don't get dollars for this. Um, but uh, one, of the, one of the great things is, is that, and I think maybe, although I don't know why so many RDACs are attached to their state medical schools, is because we're a state school, um, we can use, you know, we're, we're all the state of Tennessee. That's who I work for, right? So uh, you can, um, it, 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 it's easier to use resources that are in support of a common mission with the appropriate approvals so that you can move things forward that are in line with the needs of the RDAC, in line with the missions of the school. And so that's been a very, very helpful thing because otherwise, candidly, I don't know um, if we would have succeeded. And and we just got a, we were scheduled to sunset after a year and we got a six year, 
I don't know what it's called uh, uh, in the government, but I guess a sunrise or, you know, whatever. <laughs> so we got, I guess, six years of more sunny days. Um, so whatever that's called, we got. And so we'll be in existence um, for a while. That's great. I love how you were able to extend that metaphor. You, re you really got some uh, traction out of that, that metaphor with the sun. <laughs> Um, now I'm going to jump back to Assemblyman Benson and kind of focus this question again around, you had mentioned policy quite mm -hmm. a bit um, the last time you answered a question. And um, how do you hope that the RDAC is going to inform your policy as a legislator? Um, and then the second part of that question is, what tips would you give existing RDACs and the membership um, on those RDACs as they're working with legislators um, to enact policy recommendations that they might identify? Through their through their meetings, so kind of a two part question there. Yeah, I mean, my hope is um, at one that the RDAC gets up and running uh, quicker rather than you know, later. Sometimes appointments and things can take time, and so that's always a concern. I don't want the focus to be dropped now that we've gotten the legislation passed. Um, but I, my also hope is that there's a little bit of a sense of let's flesh out what the landscape looks like first and then try to prior prioritize some issues. Because they're, again, these issues can impact so many different policy areas. It's important for folks to focus um, and not necessarily choose the number one issue, but choose something that is uh, where there's consensus, but something that's very doable um, and, and really get those voices heard so there's some early success, people feel invested and, and can feel that success so they can tackle more challenging issues. Um, ultimately, I know there's a, there's a big debate going on in a lot of states, New Jersey, no exception, about the cost of new drugs and the cost of some existing drugs going up. Um, but that's balanced with, you know, obviously paying for the research for these groundbreaking drugs that are gonna be in trials and then ultimately get to market. And so there's a lot of good people on both sides of those, those issues. Um, but those voices, I think, of the RDAC members are really important in this because this isn't just about um, kind of where we are today with um, therapeutics, but where are we going uh, in, in the nation? And the states really need to, to speak up because ultimately we want to not end up with a national framework uh, that, that could harm uh, those with rare diseases. Great. And Assemblyman Vincent, could you, do you have sort of in the way that you gave some tactical advice to mm -hmm. advocates, do you have any tactical advice for RDACs, um, you know, based on your experience as a legislator, if they do identify policy, what are some methods and means that they can, they can use to communicate that to the state legislature um, asking for a friend? Sure. No, <laughs> I, and, and Consensus is really important, um, okay. it's not essential, um, but a consensus, when you have consensus, it really is a much more powerful voice. Um, and you know, if you, if you find the only way to get consensus is your voice is completely muted, then that's obviously not where you want to. But it also doesn't hurt when you have a large group that say yes and you have a vocal minority, present both positions to legislators. They're gonna wanna hear that uh, anyway, and it makes you more of a trusted advisor on those issues to try to show what both sides, even though you clearly come out on one aspect of that, because they're gonna hear it any uh, anyway. And, and again, I think much like those personal stories, and I loved hearing uh, Dr. Strom talk about how their RDAC starts off with somebody giving a personal story. Uh, I, I think that's so important too, that when you then speak to legislators or to folks in the administration about the issues, again, still follow through with that start with that personal story, uh, because I think it really centers about the mission of RDAC um, and really helps bridge when you're getting into sometimes very technical issues. Um, so you're, you're getting folks in on the personal story and then transitioning them off into those more maybe complicated issues. Uh, but again, understanding at the end of the day, it's because we're trying to address an issue that comes out of that story. I just wanted to add one thing to what Assemblyman Benson said, and that is that one of the challenges that we've faced as an RDAC is um, knowing when bills are going to come up and um, really having time to um, thoughtfully consider the proposal and craft a response. And in the beginning, I think we've gotten better at it. 
But that was a major hurdle for us. And I would say still is, is that we don't always know until maybe a day or two before when a bill is coming up and then trying to get the art act together if it's an important bill to get an opinion on that's thoughtful and meaningful is a challenge and i that's a problem we still haven't solved um that that we struggle with a little bit yeah and i think that's such a great point and that and i will tell you that's true for everybody um and generally um things are coming you know things have a particular kind of pathway that they happen it's just that oftentimes groups may not learn of it till it's much later that's why having a legislator that's interested in those issues on the RDAC oftentimes are really helpful because they can tell you okay this bill was introduced probably because a constituent came to a legislator but the legislator just wanted to put a bill in that bill may not be moving at all um whereas it's separate from okay this is the chair of the committee that's going to hear the bill they've put it in um it's likely to move we we should really reach out to that that chair um and oftentimes if there's by because you have an RDAC now folks will then know that it exists and say hey you know i had a constituent reach out to me on this let me go reach out to them first and that's where you know getting broad based at least the staff if not the legislators themselves getting um the majority and minority offices uh in each state staff because they're going to review all legislation that gets introduced so before it hits the committee having them know to go reach out to the rdac and, and give a heads up is so important because it's often the sponsors aren't going to necessarily know to the the advocate or the constituent asking for the bill may not know to but that minority majority staff generally are the ones that are going to look at all bills being introduced and they're in charge of that so they may not know for everything so building that relationship is so key is to get those heads up fantastic that was that's some great tactical advice um so now I want to um, ask another question for everyone. Um, just kind of a general question. What have you learned from either the legislative or the implementation phase of working on the RDAC? And what advice could you give to our listeners and the people watching this? So let's start with Thera. Something that you've learned either from the legislative phase or the implementation phase of working on this RDAC and what advice would you want to give people? Uh, I think what we're learning just from getting to know folks, even uh, just via email, as well as our one meeting, is that we really want everyone on the council to get to know each other so that there can be a common vision that everybody mm -hmm. has a, a little bit, of pe a small piece of or a, a large piece of. And I think it was um, Jana from Virginia in the first um, panel said that their first RDAC meeting was like a meet and greet which is exactly what ours was. We have so many members, it took two hours to have members introduce themselves and, and discuss the issues that they feel are really important for the rare disease community in Massachusetts. But I think you have to have that grounding and know where everyone's coming from to be able to move forward. Great. Uh, Scott, do you wanna go next? Something you've learned? You know, uh it's kind of like the law of unanticipated consequences, right? I mean, who would have expected that Las Vegas would have been built because of the Hoover Dam, uh, <laughs> right? I mean, and that's what happens. And so probably the, the cool things are, you know, building out this statewide um, rare disease network uh, so that every Tennessean can be diagnosed who has a rare disease and will have direct access. And um, that's kind of a cool thing. And, you know, we think that, you know, there's there's a lot of short read sequences that have been done. Um, so you can have with long read sequences, depending on your sequencing technology, you can, um, I don't want to go too far into that, but a lot of the genomes inferred, a certain amount of the genome is inferred. And so when you do long read sequences, it gives you an opportunity to um, understand mutations in places that may not have been called as mutations before. And so when we have these rare disease populations and 
also have mom and dad, what are called triads, it gives you an opportunity to be able to understand mutations that may not have been identified before. So that's the research arm. The second component is to be able to, um, to address the needs of Tennesseans in a way that wouldn't have been done before uh, in Tennessee. And you know, one other thought is there's there's national organizations through the NIH, um, you know, which have a similar purpose um, that that folks, and I'm sure in many of your states or some of your states, members of your ARDAC will be a member of those national consortiums. What this does is it gives it a much more local basis so that, you know, you know the providers, you understand your state, and you can really help facilitate the care, particularly of children, but not only of children um, across the entire state. A lot of the kids um, don't actually need sequencing necessarily. They need a metabolic test or they need something else. So just to get them into a doctor who specializes in the rare disease field um, can be incredibly empowering for the patient and knowing that there's someone with expertise on the other side of the phone um, it is really great for people who are on their diagnostic odyssey and, and don't necessarily have a lot of hope. Um, so just the, the ability to be able to give hope to patients uh, in need is a really, um, it, it's really, it's, it's been terrific. And we're just getting started. I don't want to. I don't want to make anybody think like we're the be all and end all to RDAX. Like we're struggling like everybody else. Uh, but but you asked me for a good thing. No, I, I, that sounds wonderful. And it sounds like in your state, really being able to see innovative ways to approach problems that are pretty persistent um, with medicine using the RDAX. So that's very exciting and encouraging. Um, Assemblyman Benson, any piece of advice or anything you've learned along the way? Yeah, I, I would say sometimes the easy things are the hard things. It's like, so bills that you think are a no brainer and everybody else agrees because everybody agrees, sometimes it falls to the wayside because folks are focused on the fights. And oftentimes to get that, that focus, to get it across the finish line, uh, it's important to kind of grab folks' attention, even though everybody seems to agree on it. Um, I've seen a lot of bills kind of just get pushed to the back of the line because they just assume it's gonna happen on its own. And it really doesn't without all the advocacy. Um, and so I think I saw that in the process for our RDAC. Um, and then secondarily, you know, for, for a lot of reasons, we oftentimes focus on children with rare disease um, because the stories are more powering. Parents are just such great advocates for their children. Um, but the converse of that is oftentimes adults with rare disease get lost in the discussion. And we saw that happen a little bit with the RDAX as well. And so we had to, you know, kind of make sure that we were pushing uh, some of our adults to the front as well who sometimes aren't as comfortable <laughs> with that, um, but making sure that that's there too, because oftentimes legislators would get the wrong impression that this was really about only children, um, even though it's that's clearly not. Um, and so making sure that we also don't reinforce misperceptions about the rare disease community uh, in the process. Um, and, and so that was the other kind of piece in the legislative process that, that I learned. Um, so we try to make a focus on that as well. That's great. That's that's very insightful. And and I think your your point about making sure that the adult side isn't left out benefits even pediatrics, right? Because we know transition of care can be difficult when kids grow out of pediatrics. So I think that's that's a lesson we've learned in the state as well. Um, so we're down to just our last couple of minutes. Um, and I want to just ask very quickly, maybe with a one one minute um, answer, um, looking into the future, Thera, five years from now, is there anything you would like to say that your council accomplished in the state of Massachusetts? Yes, I'm uh, hoping that the uh, council members can decide on uh, what their vision is going to be for the long term. And in five years, uh, whatever that is, that we have something measurable that we can mm. look at that improve the lives of people in the rare disease community in Massachusetts. I don't know what that is, but if we have five years, hopefully we can figure that out. Great. And Dr. Strom, five years from now, one thing you would like to be able to say you've accomplished. 
Well, I would like to see every um, child and adult uh, afflicted with rare disease in the state of Tennessee have access to a knowledgeable provider, um, either virtually and in person, so that they can be diagnosed and, and, and really begin their appropriate treatment when available. Um, and, you know, that's what I hope to accomplish. The second thing, um, you know, I've been watching a lot of Congress, so I'm giving myself a moment of personal privilege, I believe it's called, uh, or I'm asking for one. The second thing is, um, you know, it's easy to do this. Uh, it's hard to do this alone. It's easy to do this or easier to do this in partnership with organizations like NORD. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think this type of meeting is really important. And I believe that um, the more that we can learn from one another um, and work synergistically to enhance each other's efforts, um, I don't think any of us care if we get credit for this, right? That's not what it's about. It's really about helping other people. And so given that, um, if we can if we can find a way to work more collaboratively and more in a more integrated fashion, um, I think it will behoove us all and, and most importantly, our patients. I could not agree more. That's a that's a beautiful way to wrap up the discussion, Dr. Strom. And I just want to thank each of you so much for this conversation. I know I personally learned a ton that I'm going to be able to apply in my own state. Um, so with that, I'm going to send it back to Elise. Thank you so much, all of you, for this wonderful panel. Thank you, Erica, and each of our panelists for providing us with insight into your unique RDACs. It's always um, really nice to learn from RDAC leaders on their experiences. So we hope that you all enjoyed our webinar today um, and had the opportunity to learn something new about RDACs. And before we wrap up, I would like to quickly share a few more updates. Um, if you haven't had the opportunity to check out our Project RDAC website, please be sure to do so. This website is regularly updated to give states uh, state updates, also provide upcoming events, and will serve as a hub for all of your resources to assist with creating and, and implementing an RDAC in your state. And as we mentioned before, none of this work would be possible without our amazing rare disease advocates. And to stay engaged on opportunities happening in your state, please be sure to join our Rare Action Network today by visiting www.rareaction.org. And did you find today's webinar um, leaving you with any additional questions or are you interested in becoming more involved with our RDAC efforts? If so, please feel free to reach out to our policy team at RDAC at rarediseases.org. And finally, I would like to thank all of our Project RDAC supporters, Alexion, Biogen, Bluebird Bio, Bowringer Ingelheim, CSL Bearing, Horizon Therapeutics, Genentech, Pfizer, Serepta Therapeutics, Takeda, and Vertex Pharmaceuticals for their continued support. And a big thank you for spending your afternoon with us. We look forward to continuing to work with all of you as we continue our Project RDAC efforts.